Hello and welcome back to English 332 Writing in the Professions. And today I've got some bad news for you. We will talk about negative messages. Uh, so I guess there's some good news here. We will learn how to handle a topic that uh, I think for many people uh, get really uncomfortable. Uh, we don't like having to give bad news to people. We don't like rejecting people, uh, uh, having to disappoint them or potentially even anger them. And I think the, the tips that we'll get into in this in this presentation will go a long ways, I think, not just to helping you with your uh, send negative messages in the business world, but also maybe even in your personal life. I, I, I think uh, uh, plenty of times we've had to give people, uh, friends uh, or significant others bad news, and I think a lot of this stuff would apply uh, to that as well. Or kids, if you have kids, you might even uh, try this out on them. Uh, also, you can't depend on that the uh, company you work for will have boilerplate. Uh, I know when I was reading this, I know uh, some people work in tech support or customer service, and they, they sort of have routine ways to uh, address common problems like this. Uh, but you can't count on that. You know, you might be in a situation where you have to sit down and write an email yourself. And uh, again, this chapter has lots of great tips on how to do that effectively. Anyway, with all that said, uh, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get into this. And here are the learning objectives uh, for today. We'll be talking about the different purposes, the different kinds, I guess, negative messages, different ways to organize those, uh, ways to construct the different parts, how to improve the tone of a negative message. I think this one is really important. Uh, ways to construct different kinds of negative messages. And then finally, we'll get back to that topic that's come up several times already. Uh, what kind of technology should you use? Uh, and sometimes these can be very sensitive, very delicate matters. Maybe the email is not the best choice. Maybe that's uh, you should go to the go to the office, see them face to face, or use the phone. Uh, so anyway, uh, so let's start by talking about the different uh, kinds of negative messages. And I want you to think before we get into this about maybe some negative messages you've received, maybe recently, or maybe something from the past that really st stung you. Uh, very bad news. Now, you don't need to go tell me what the news was, but I just think about the way that message was delivered to you and ask yourself, could it have been worded differently? Uh, could it have been approached in a different fashion so that uh, the negative message would have still been conveyed, but not had such a dramatic <laughs> negative emotional response? Uh, basically, could it have been done better? Uh, so ask yourself that and think about that for a few minutes. All right, so back here, we're talking about these uh, different kinds of negative messages. And of course, this is just uh, information uh, that's something negative. It's something they're not going to uh, to like. <laughs> you apply for a loan, you get rejected for the loan. Uh, you apply to Harvard, you get rejected uh, at Harvard. You apply for a scholarship. I mean, the list just goes on and on, right? Uh, maybe you're at a restaurant and you sit down there to and order your usual, uh, the, your favorite dish, the thing you always get when you go there, and they tell you they are out, <laughs> not serving that today, or maybe even worse, they don't even offer that anymore. Uh, so there's all kinds of occasions all around us in the business world, academic world, uh, they're everywhere, right? And I'm sure you've delivered a few yourself. Uh, so the message will not benefit them. Uh, it's not something they uh, will be delighted to see. Uh, usually they will uh, be disappointed or even uh, angry uh, about it. And they got some varieties here, uh, rejections and refusals we've been kind of focusing on here. Uh, but there's also other kinds, uh, policy changes not benefiting uh, the customer. Uh, there's some examples of this in the book from insurance companies that are no longer offering certain uh, coverage, for example. Uh, banks uh, can change all the time, right, the way they handle money. Uh, the list just goes on and on. Uh, poor performance appraisal. I mean, nobody wants to get one of those, but, you know, if you've been slacking off at the job, you might uh, receive a uh, one of those. Uh, or even worse, a disciplinary notice. Uh, hopefully you won't get, ever get one of those, but if you are breaking company rules, uh, you might get that. Uh, insulting, intrusive uh, requests, and then uh, product recalls. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this last category. Uh, you see these all the time, and they have to be handled really delicately uh, because they can easily put a company out of business if it causes uh, the customers or the fans of that product to turn away from it. 
Now let's look at the uh, primary purposes of a negative message. Uh, obviously to give the audience the bad news. Uh, that's probably the most obvious <laughs> purpose, right? Uh, but then uh, think a little more about it. Uh, there's some underlying purposes. Uh, one is that they need to actually read it. Uh, so you got to get their attention somehow, or they might not even uh, realize it's important and just ignore it. Of course, they need to understand what it is and then uh, accept it. Probably that last piece is the hardest. Uh, to maintain as much goodwill as possible. Uh, so again, with those uh, product recalls, Toyota, Volks uh, Volkswagen, <laughs> just a couple in recent memory, you see uh, all the time in the grocery store, they'll have some recalls on uh, food items, uh, maybe a bag of chips, uh, who knows. Uh, so they're having to recall that product, but they have to be careful because again, they don't want people to say, well, you know, I I'm not shopping at that store again. They, they have unsafe food there. I, I won't buy that particular brand of cereal or eggs or whatever it is. Uh, so that's another purpose. Uh, the secondary purpose is uh, to build a good image of the communicator. Uh, that's you basically, right? No one writing the message or, or sending the message. You want them to, even if it's bad news that they won't like, you don't want, there's no reason for them to <laughs> hate the messenger. <laughs> Uh, to, unless you give them one, uh, to build good image of the communicator's organization. Uh, so we'll get more into this one further along, but uh, when you're working in a business capacity, communicating as a business writer, it's not just your own personal reputation on the line, uh, but what you do and say can actually come back and reflect on that entire uh, company. Uh, so they, we'll talk about the apologizing, how that kind of could sound like you're accepting responsibility for something, which may or may not be the case, but in the since you're writing from the as a business person, uh, you're basically making that company liable for something, which uh, you know could get you fired. And then uh, to avoid future messages on the same subject. So we talked about this before, uh, I think in the positive messages, but if you're vague about things or you're confusing, uh, then they'll probably send you more and more messages trying to get clarification on it, and uh, that can just end up wasting company time. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, how many emails do they say people are getting? Uh, business people get maybe 500 emails, seems like, a, a day. The uh, last thing you want is for that to double, <laughs> become a 1,000, uh, because the people that you're responding to keep replying back, asking more questions. Uh, so with the purposes, uh, you know, obviously when you're sending a negative message, uh, it's not going to make the person happy. Uh, a situation I've been in many, many times, I've applied to conferences, I, you know, write a paper abstract proposal, I send it off to the conference, and then they, uh, I don't get in, right? I get rejected from the conference. Or I submit a, I remember back in, uh, in college, I was always sending uh, manuscripts off to book publishers to try to get uh, them interested in my uh, novel, and of course they uh, re <laughs> rejected it. Uh, obviously, that's not going to make anybody happy to be rejected that way, uh, but that doesn't mean it needs to do more damage uh, than necessary, right? It's really, it, it's sort of the idea that, um, you know, how can you minimize the damage? You're going to do some, right? But how can you uh, minimize it? That's really the goal here. Uh, so what you want the audience to feel like when they get this message, uh, uh, the first is they need to feel like they've been taken seriously. Uh, so thinking about those conference proposal rejections or the, uh, the book proposals, uh, they didn't imply in there that they didn't like the manuscript or they thought it <laughs> sucked or the research was poor, uh, the research was poor, uh, anything like that. Uh, instead, they tried to be as respectful as they as they could. And, um, show some, uh, I guess, some um, uh, compassion uh, for the person getting <laughs> rejected, right? Uh, regrettably, blah, blah, blah. Not, <laughs> what makes you think we'd publish this garbage? <laughs> uh, the decision is fair and reasonable. Uh, so a lot of those, a lot of times they'll mention something like how many uh, people apply to that conference and the rejection rate is very high. So you shouldn't feel bad about it. You know, many people get rejected, very few get selected. You can always try again next time, right? And also putting yourself in, into their situation, uh, thinking about the, or if they were in your situation, they would make <laughs> the same decision. 
Uh, so if you can make people see that, uh, I think that would take a lot of the uh, sting away. Let's see, organizing negative messages for, uh, yeah, we'll do clients and customers, and then there's a couple other situations uh, coming up here uh, after this. Uh, so now this is dealing with clients, customers, I might even put students in here. Uh, professor writing to a student. Uh, when you have a reason that the audience will understand and accept, uh, give the reason before uh, the refusal. All right, so if you can show them uh, why, basically, and you think they will agree, uh, there's just, you know, that's your best way to lead off. Uh, don't dwell on the negative information. Just give it once. Uh, it doesn't need to be repeated. You know, every time it's like giving somebody a slap. You slap them once. <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, don't keep doing it over and over again by uh, coming back around again and again to the uh, negative thing. Uh, presenting alternatives or compromises. Uh, this can go a long ways towards uh, diffusing this, right? So you, I think one of the examples I gave earlier was uh, this was it a rowing machine, I think? And so you're working at this gym, and uh, the rowing machine breaks down, and let's say that's the situation, right? So you got somebody coming in there, one of the clients there, and you know she loves that rowing machine. Uh, so, uh-oh, <laughs> this she's probably not going to like that, uh, that she won't be able to work out on today. Uh, so you could probably think about this third one, right? So let's just stop there. So what would be some ways you could do this third option here. What, what are some alternatives or compromises you could present uh, to this client? Uh, and then ending with positive uh, forward-looking statements. Uh, so yeah, this it didn't go so well this time, but <laughs> let's think about next time. <laughs> now we, we can avoid this issue in the future, but this won't be a problem later on. Uh, anything like that, again, to try to move past that negative item. Uh, and now we're talking about negative messages to uh, superiors. So, you know, something has gone wrong and, oh, my God, now you got to <laughs> tell the manager, <laughs> supervisor about it, <laughs> uh, the dean, whoever. Uh, it probably won't, you know, this is it's really delicate here because, if again, if you don't do a good job writing this, uh, they might feel like it's your fault or you're to blame or you've been careless, uh, anything like that. So to the degree that you can avoid that, the better. Uh, starting by describing the problem uh, clearly, like what exactly is happening here, uh, tell how it happened. So let's think about this, uh, the rowing machine breaking down, right? So you, you're going to explain it one way to the client coming in that wants to use that rowing machine. Uh, that's going to be different than when the uh, owner of the gym or the manager comes in and you're just having to talk about, well, the machine broke down. Uh, so you could imagine the First part of that would be, well, what happened? Uh, what, <laughs> how, how did it happen? Uh, was it poorly maintained? Uh, was it an accident? Um, uh, describe the options for fixing it. So I don't know if you would, just as somebody that works at the gym, I don't know if this would be your responsibility or not, but uh, I guess you could, you might be in a position there where you uh, have, you, maybe you've talked to the, uh, the company, the, the repair person, uh, recommending solutions and and, and ask uh, for action. So what can maybe the manager, I guess, let's just say the, there's the owner of the gym maybe doesn't really know anything about the day-to-day -day operations. They're just the owner. <laughs> uh, they got the money. They're not really involved in the business per se. Uh, and maybe you're the uh, uh, manager. Uh, so you'd have to tell that owner, uh, look, you know, we looked into some of the options here for repairs or maybe Maybe that rowing machine is just on its last leg anyway, and we should just get a new one. All right, and then finally, organizing messages for the uh, your peers, your subordinates, basically your coworkers, people that are people that are on your same level of the uh, corporate hierarchy, uh, the corporate ladder. Uh, so with them, you can be uh, objective about it, right? Clear. Uh, presenting those alternatives or compromises again. So you see, this is not all that different than the other uh, purposes. But you can ask them for input or action. So maybe they've got suggestions for you. Um, maybe they can accept uh, outcomes better. Audience may accept outcomes better. Uh, I think sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes I might have a problem. Uh, 
uh, with one of the software <laughs> programs we use, let's say, <laughs> a D2L is down, uh, I can't upload my my lecture, let's say. Uh, so I could talk talking about it, if I was talking about that problem with my fellow professors here, uh, I would uh, just tell them what's, you know, here's the deal, you know, D2L is down, I can't upload my assignments. But then I can ask them uh, for their input, right? So maybe they've got, maybe this has happened to them and they know some other ways around it. They might say, well, instead of using uh, D2L, why don't you just print it out? <laughs> uh, okay, parts of negative messages. Uh, so we're gonna get into these in a, in a few minutes. Subject lines, that's the email line, I guess, topic, topic line. Uh, buffers, reasons, refusals, alternatives, and endings. All right, so here's the subject line. And if, if you ever send an email, you know what these are, right? It's just the, what you put at the top. Uh, there's usually a special little blank for this. Uh, so how, what do you want to put in the subject line? So let's come up with an example again. Let's, let's say you're sending out an email uh, to all the uh, people that work out at your gym telling them about that the rowing machine is broken down. Okay, so that's our, let's, let, let that be our <laughs> subject. Uh, okay, so they say the first thing you should do in the subject line is include the topic, but not the specific negative. Use negative subject lines uh, when the audience may ignore uh, the message, needs information to act, and keep in mind not everyone reads all their messages. So let's see if we can apply this to our uh, example with the, with the gym. Uh, so you wouldn't want the subject line uh, to say something like uh, "rowing machine attention, rowing machine is broken." <laughs> uh, that give that's going that's giving this the specific negative. And so see if you can come up with uh, another topic uh, that's a little more general than that. And then uh, also to factor in that they they might just think this is just another email that you, maybe this gym sends out routine emails, just kind of newsletter-y type stuff. Uh, and they might ignore it, but it could be, you don't want them showing up thinking the machine is, is actually working, right? So you want them to pay attention to it. Uh, so think about this one too. And then uh, I don't know if they necessarily need information to act uh, with this. And they can uh, make their own decision whether to go to the gym or not, I guess. Uh, so see what you can do with this coming up with a topic or a subject line that talks about the topic but doesn't go into that specific negative, uh, but also it would, would be something that they would focus on or, or at least uh, open. All right, so the, uh, the next part is the buffer statement. And this is just a, uh, it could be neutral or positive, but it's just something, a statement uh, that you're going to uh, give before you launch into this negative information. It's kind of a way to uh, soften the blow. <laughs> I guess they got some cushions there, some pillows. Uh, so you got something terrible that you need to tell somebody, uh, but maybe it's not always the best idea just to blurt that out. Uh, so that's why we use these buffers. And there's some sp uh, specific times to use them. They, they talk about audience, uh, audiences that values uh, harmony. Uh, so somebody that really cares about, that doesn't like shakeups, you know, they want things to uh, stay peaceful, they, they, they don't like a discord, uh, maybe somebody like that you should use a buffer on. And they said sometimes something interesting in the book was that uh, it could be it, just individual people, uh, but you could also be thinking about different cultures and how, uh, I think we've talked about Japan before, and so they might have a different uh, approach to this uh, idea of the buffer. Uh, whereas uh, other audiences might just be uh, insulted by that and say, just get to the point, right? <laughs> Tell me straight, Doc. <laughs> uh, they could uh, use the buffer when the buffer can serve another purpose. Uh, we'll talk about that more coming up here. Uh, and use a buffer when you can write a good one. Uh, again, the book stresses how uh, most of the time you're better off just getting to the point uh, because you can inadvertently damage uh, your reputation or create ill will. Uh, with a poorly done buffer that doesn't seem sincere or that just seems uh, maybe like you're beating around the bush, uh, delaying. Uh, not everybody likes that. It's not always a good idea. In fact, it's usually not a good idea. All right, let's look at some common types of these uh, positives and good news. 
Uh, so maybe there's some bad news at the company, but there's also some good stuff going on. So you might, uh, why uh, open it up with the bad news might kind of uh, uh, focus too much on the negatives, <laughs> negativity, right? Uh, maybe if you start off by talking about the good stuff that's happening, uh, that can uh, prepare them better mentally, right? A fact of chronology, a fact or chronology of events. So how did they get to this point? Uh, references to enclosures, I guess that uh, <laughs> would be a way to delay the news, right? Uh, see it attached here, you'll find blah, blah, blah. Uh, thanking the audience. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming to the meeting where I'm about to fire you all. <laughs> I'm kind of being facetious there, but uh, again, just something to put in front of that bad news. Uh, general principles, you remind people of the general principles of the company, maybe the motto, the slogan of the school or uh, organization. And then we get into the reasons. Uh, so the convincing reasons should precede the refusal. Clear reasons. Uh, so if, you, if you're denying that loan, right, or you're, you're, you're telling a student, you know, you didn't get the scholarship. Uh, whatever it is, instead of just jumping right into saying uh, you will not get the scholarship or we have refused your request. Uh, instead of that, if you start by talking about the reasons you know, why that person was refused, uh, maybe they uh, maybe their application was great, but it's just just so happened that uh, you know, it's very competitive and they might have been uh, people that just had uh, better, uh, more publications or, or more <laughs> or better GPAs or whatever. Uh, so if they know what the reason is, uh, that will help. Yeah, preparing them uh, for the refusal. And you hear this all the time. I'm always, if you look at any of those award shows on TV, the pageants or uh, contests or Oscars, I guess, whatever it is, uh, you know, they, on the one hand, yeah, they're giving great news to the, to the winner. Uh, but at the same time, they're giving bad news uh, to all the losers uh, there, right? So if you if your movie didn't win or you didn't get the uh, the golden or the globe, or whatever they call it, uh, that's bad news for you. I see you see they always talk about the reasons or the criteria and all this maybe a little background uh, on the selection process uh, before they just announce the uh, the winners and indirectly the losers. And it's just for this purpose. Uh, helping the audience to accept that refusal. And they tell you don't hide behind the uh, company policy. And so you've probably been in this situation if you've worked in customer service or worked with the general public, right? Uh, somebody's asking you to do something, you can't do it. It's it's against the rules. Uh, so what they tell you is, is uh, don't assume, don't just think you can just say, well, that's just, you know, company policy means we can't do that. And that can just make people mad. Yeah, show how the policy benefits uh, the audience. Uh, they, uh, one of the examples they gave in the book I thought was good was the um, movie theaters not letting you uh, text as you're trying to watch a movie. <laughs> I think they get mad. I think they might even throw you out. Uh, I wish they would be a little more strict on it. I've seen people do this anyway. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine this. If somebody gets caught and they're, they're not going to get to see the movie, uh, because they're on, the, they've been texting the whole time. Somebody complained, and etc. Uh, so instead of just saying, "Well, it's a company policy," the policy of the standard that you cannot talk text on the mobile, you know, <laughs> just kind of hiding behind the policy. Uh, that wouldn't be as effective as, as saying, "Look, you know, here's the deal. You know, it's it's better for everybody uh, not to have these uh, devices going off all the time and the lighting and everything. It actually does benefit you." It's not just a, a negative, uh, but maybe there's just no benefit uh, at all. So <laughs> in that case, omit the policy uh, from the message. If there's if there's no way to, to spin it, I guess, uh, then don't even put it in. Okay, so then we get to the refusal part of this, and they say put the refusal in a paragraph uh, with reason to put refusal in paragraph with reason to de-emphasize. Uh, imply a refusal if you can, make it crystal clear, and finalize message on subject. Uh, don't write a second message <laughs> to say no. <laughs> and who would do that? That's just cruel. 
<clears throat> all right, so then we're going to break these down uh, one at a time. Uh, so let's you, you refuse somebody something. Maybe they asked for a discount. Uh, maybe they ask for a menu item that's not on the menu today. Maybe the item is not there. Maybe maybe they've ordered the lobster, and you know what? We don't have any lobsters. I don't know what to do. Well, obviously you can offer some alternatives, and any good server at a restaurant would be able to easily do this, right? Um, let's see, let's look at what they put first here. Let's see. Offers ways to get what offers a ways to get what the audience wants. So that'd be great if you can do it. <laughs> I guess you could say, I'll oh, come back tomorrow and we'll have the lobster then. Uh, shows you care about the audience's needs. Well, yeah, that, that's a good point. So if they, if you're not able to offer the lobster, <laughs> I don't know why I keep thinking about lobsters, but uh, if you do take the time there to mention some alternatives, maybe some different items on the menu, or a different uh, when they might come back, you know, that's better than just saying, look, we don't have it. Get out. <laughs> uh, returns audiences psychological freedom, uh, freedom of choice. This was a really interesting one. I was reading up on it a little bit. Uh, on I just kind of Googled this, <laughs> kind of curious about it. Because uh, so, they're saying that when you refuse somebody or you tell them no, uh, they might try to use, um, I guess, uh, what's the word, passive... Um, aggressive strategies. <laughs> uh, they're basically going to uh, try to get back at you uh, some way, right? They might, uh, if you, you know, if you turn somebody down for a promotion, for example, they might uh, just start slacking off big time, right? Or uh, just uh, basically just trying to get back at you. Or, or if they think they, yeah, they talked about uh, firing somebody and how that, uh, sometimes those people get violent and come back and you know, shoot, shoot up the place. Uh, so it's a very serious issue. Uh, now, I don't know if offering alternatives would necessarily uh, prevent that, but it sure couldn't hurt. And the idea is you're kind of returning, you're saying, no, you know, you, I'm not going to do that, or you can't do that. And when they hear that, they feel like, oh, I'm, I feel powerless now, right? I, I don't feel like I've got control. Uh, I've lost my freedom. I've got to exert my freedom in some other way, some <laughs> probably abusive way, negative way. Uh, but if you could uh, give them some alternatives up front, like, um, yeah, we, uh, sorry about the, we weren't able uh, to give you the scholarship, but uh, there are some other scholarships you can apply to, uh, and there will be other prizes and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, feel free to submit this some other place. <laughs> uh, sometimes with those publishers and conferences that they'll say, uh, well, the, we, we're not going to accept your proposal for this conference, but we we think it would be a better fit at this other conference, and they'll uh, give you the information to apply a web link, a website you can apply to that other conference. Uh, so that really just that really makes you feel a lot better to see that uh, it's not it doesn't just feel like they they slapped you. You know they're they're not able to help you, but they're in one way, but they're trying to help you in another way, and and that's nice. Yeah, allows you to end on a positive note. Now we get to the, the ending. <laughs> yeah, everything has to end at some point, I guess, right? Even a negative message. Uh, so see if you can refer to a good alternative at the end. Uh, we kind of talked about that one already. Uh, best endings uh, look to the future. All right, so yes, yeah, so you've gotten some, we've had to give you some bad news today. It's, it's unpleasant stuff, but you know what? <laughs> uh, Tomorrow is the new day. Uh, things will improve. I see this sometimes in... Uh, the SESU will send the professors these, uh, or the faculty association, we get these messages. And a lot of the times it'll be something bad, like a budget cut, uh, uh, just, you know, uh, something's not going as well as they wanted, that sort of thing. Uh, but they always end it uh, with some kind of positive uh, message about uh, the future, right? So, yeah, this particular uh, year the budget is down, but uh, we we're expecting a uh, bigger enrollment next time. Uh, you know, and, and <laughs> there's always been ups and downs, uh, uh, you know, no matter how far back you go, right? So kind of in a slump now, but uh, things are looking uh, good for next year, right? Or maybe two or three years from now. 
<laughs> or maybe if we all work together, we can make uh, the future better than uh, the present. Uh, maybe something like that. Uh, now, what you don't want to do is have an insincere ending. Uh, this just shows a tone, what you might call tone deafness, right? Somebody's, you're not showing that you, uh, you're not showing the right emotion, basically. It's almost like you're disrespecting. You might even look like you're happy about their uh, misfortune, they're being refused. Uh, you might sound like you don't really care. You know, and that could make it worse. Uh, so here's some examples, I guess, of insincere endings. Uh, please let us know if we can be of further help. Yeah, so you've just been fired. <laughs> and the end of that email says, please let us know if we can be of further help. Well, you haven't helped me yet, you know. <laughs> I, further help, you know, if that's what you call help, you know, hurt me. <laughs> this, this, it's kind of a silly way. It's just, you know, I think a lot of this stuff in this chapter made me realize that, well, we just kind of rattle off this stuff. We think it's the right thing to say. We've heard it a billion times, so we just kind of repeat it, uh, repeat it just because we think it sounds right. Don't really think about what, what it is we're actually communicating. And that's really what they're trying to get at here. Uh, so here we go with, with apologies. And uh, the book tells you simply don't apologize. And when you read that, you think that sounds a little mean, right? That, isn't that kind of harsh? <laughs> Isn't it nice to apologize to people to say you're sorry, uh, even if it's not really your fault? Just you know, you see somebody's upset, so our instinct is to say, "Look, I'm sorry." You know, I didn't mean to, to do that, or uh, you know, I'm sorry that <laughs> that you're uh, that I made you upset, and anything like that. Uh, we tend to just leap into it without really thinking. Uh, but in a business context, uh, this can get the company sued, right? And if you drive a car, which I assume most of you do, or truck maybe more likely in minnesota uh, you have a uh, insurance card and look at that card sometime and you'll notice it gives you this advice don't apologize so if you get into a wreck maybe you maybe it's just clearly your fault you know, you're totally responsible no question uh, but they still say don't apologize don't uh don't admit blame don't admit fault because uh, once you do that you've pretty much on the hook uh, for the bill or the insurance company is anyway right and especially if it's maybe it is your fault maybe it's not uh, but if you run over there and you start saying look I'm, I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm so sorry um, you're basically admitting uh, guilt and you probably get uh, that puts the insurance company basically in a bad position they won't be able to argue uh, that it wasn't your fault because uh, you were there saying apologizing right uh, so that's really what what this is about and they say don't apologize if correcting uh, only a small error and again this is just trying to get away from this habitual use of apologies because uh, if, if you're in that habit uh, you might slip one <laughs> where you should uh, when you're not at fault don't apologize obviously uh, however do apologize uh, only once <laughs> trying to think of some of these politicians lately that have been uh, caught doing something and they'll have their apologies and there's always this little debate about well was that a sincere apology uh, are they just uh saying this to kind of get people off their backs uh, so they i guess it would if they keep saying it over and over again that begins to make you feel like well maybe they're not uh, they keep it's almost like they're having to convince themselves <laughs> that they're sorry because <laughs> uh, they keep repeating it you know uh, apologize early in the message right so you don't want people dwelling on it it's it's kind of a again a bad situation to be in when you've done something wrong you're having to apologize uh, get it over with don't you don't want them to keep coming back to it yeah briefly again don't don't go on that the, sort of the less time you have to spend on this uh, the better and then the obvious one and probably the hardest one is the sincerely part so if you can't be sincere about it <laughs> you need to go back to the drawing board i guess <laughs> Uh, because this is, if you're apologizing and people don't think you mean it, uh, that's going to make them even more upset uh, than if you didn't apologize at all. all right, so sometimes I think that's why these, uh, again, why some of these uh, political types don't ever apologize for stuff. Uh, because they know that uh, no matter how hard they try, they won't be able to sound sincere. And maybe they're not really sorry anyway. They, they know they won't be able to fake it that well. That's just kind of my, my personal theory. But... I think the book is right here that, uh, again, 
If you can't be sincere, you're better off not apologizing at all. You're just going to make matters worse. I left off one. So by focusing on how to correct a situation. And so if you got an easy remedy uh, for them, you could apologize. It's not going to be a big deal since there's an easy fix for it, right? Uh, now we get into the tone of the message. And uh, they, <laughs> they got here in the notes that <laughs> a tone and a negative message can, can build or destroy goodwill. And they got some pretty sensitive topics they talk about in the book. They talked about, there's a little sidebar I was reading about uh, oncologists, you know, cancer doctors, basically. And they, they frequently have to tell people that, you know, you got this cancer, you're going to die, basically. It's a horrible thing to have to tell people. And, of course, uh, the tone, you know, how they say that is uh, critical. I mean, just think about how, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of a, <laughs> a worse message uh, than anybody would ever get uh, than something like that. Uh, so they actually send the doctors to these programs, or I guess training programs, where they learn just how to say that in a, with the right tone. Right? So even like the pitch of the voice. I don't know if they get into like body language and stuff, but uh, anyway, it's just crucial stuff. And uh, anyway, let's get into this. Uh, kind of sad even thinking about that uh, uh, negative message. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so the tone is your implied attitude of the author towards the audience uh, and the subject. So if you hear that, I guess this oncologist, if they say if they say this, well, if they say it too matter of factly, right? Well, here here's the, or they joke about it even, or they don't seem like they're caring at all. Uh, then you say, well, this doctor is very cold. Uh, so this doctor uh, seems to have some emotional issues or something. You know, I can't believe they're so callous. Uh, they they don't care about me at all. Uh, to say this, and, you know, another example you see all the time of this is on uh, cop shows, detective shows, where the uh, the cops or the detectives have to go tell the uh, loved ones uh, that their you know, significant other, their dad, their husband, whoever it is, has been murdered, <laughs> and uh, they, they talk a lot about this, you know, how to get the right tone, and uh, sometimes there's some humor around that actually, but a lot of times they mess it up. Uh, shows you took the request uh, seriously. And so I guess this one, they're coming back to that uh, idea of the, uh, like this, the book manuscripts, or the conference presentations. Uh, people put a lot of work into those, right? And they might spend, especially if it's a book uh, that you've written or a short story or the, even this abstract for the conference. Uh, you know, you took a long time to write it. Uh, you thought you were going to get in. Uh, you don't want to come across sounding like you don't care. Uh, use the positive emphasis and the you attitudes. Remember, thinking uh, about them, uh, you want the message to be about them more than it is about you. Uh, thinking about the, the visual appearance, I can imagine lots of ways you can go wrong with that. Uh, imagine getting a piece of bad news on a piece of uh, pink paper or with a Comic Sans font. Uh, it might seem like they're mocking you, uh, which would probably, uh, <laughs> probably wouldn't go over well. Uh, consider the timing of the message. Uh, that, that's always a good thing to consider. Uh, I don't know if they're thinking literally about the time of day, probably more of the uh, what else might be going on in this person's life. Uh, is it the right time to give them this information? All right, this is about alternative strategies for the whole deal. So you got bad news to deliver. Uh, but is there some way you could put a positive spin on it? So recasting uh, the situation as a positive <laughs> message. <laughs> uh, so I see this sometimes. Uh, one of the examples that really sticks out to me is uh, they had a new policy at SESU where they, it says no tobacco. So before you could smoke outside, you could just go outside the building and smoke, and then they changed it so that you uh, couldn't smoke at all. You couldn't even do the the skull, the uh, chewing tobacco, and all this stuff. Uh, so they tried. They they didn't say it like a negative thing though. They they spun it in a positive way. And the, the way they spun it was by saying that you know SESU is, is now a clean air uh, university, right? The, <laughs> and this, this would be a much healthier environment uh, for everybody. So they didn't even mention anything negative about it. 
Uh, whereas I, I can imagine the people that like to smoke outside got, got mad about it. As a persuasive uh, message, this is a you know another interesting idea uh, with with the smoking. I can imagine again with that, yeah, you're gonna make some people upset with the smoking message, uh, but maybe you could put a little persuasion in there, right, and say and now might be a good time to think about giving up the uh, the smoking uh, habit is unhealthy for you, and we do have programs here on campus, counseling uh, services where you can go and get counseling to help you deal with that. Uh, you shouldn't be smoking anyway. So let's look at the different varieties of these. Uh, this first one's claims uh, and complaints. I think we've all done one or the other at some point in our lives and been on the other end of, of one of these too. So something's gone wrong. Right? Uh, something's broken. Uh, somebody's uh, uh, car broke down. <laughs> uh, they don't have the lobster. Uh, something's gone wrong here. What? what? What can we do? And what's the best way to approach this message? And they, they say, just use a direct organization pattern. What does that mean? Well, give the supporting facts, uh, the identifiers. So what are the, what are the facts of the situation, right? Avoid the anger, avoid anger and sarcasm <laughs> or threats <laughs> uh, that you'll never use that company again. And man, oh man, oh man, if you have ever done customer service, you've got examples of this uh, just people that call uh, up and sometimes they'll just have the most absurd thing they want right and it's clear that you can't do it and you try to be as nice as you can uh, telling them they can't do it but then they'll they'll just get well if, if that's the case then i'll never shop at this pharmacy again <laughs> slam the phone down <laughs> and uh, really what does that accomplish it just makes you look like an idiot and uh, all the other customer service people will be talking about you and, and laughing uh, behind the scenes there. So um, my advice is don't ever yell or get angry at some customer service person. You're not going to get anything done. You're just going to make yourself look bad. All right, rejections uh, and refusals. A little different strategies for those. Uh, requests from uh, external audience. So I guess this is just somebody outside the company. Uh, try to think of that buffer if you come up with a good one, some way to pad this. Uh, again, keep those reasons in mind, though, why you might not want to do that. Uh, give specific reasons. So the person, if their scholarship was re that scholarship application got rejected, the proposal was rejected, uh, maybe wanted that promotion, a loan, whatever. Uh, why aren't they giving it to you? Uh, they're refusing it. You want to know the specific reasons. And if they can do that, uh, this will this will help, right? So you go to the bank. I, I'll tell you an example of something that I'm going through right now. Uh, so we're I'm part of the search committee uh, for a uh, creative writing faculty uh, professor. And uh, one of the steps of this is going through every application there. And we've got all these criteria that we use to go through each one's very tedious, very laborious process. Uh, but we have to give very specific reasons why we think somebody shouldn't be considered uh, for the position. Uh, so you can't just say, well, I just don't like the, <laughs> I don't like this person. <laughs> or I just got a bad feeling about this person. Uh, nothing like that would fly. Uh, you have to look, one of the criteria, for example, is uh, like a, a, what was the word? I'm blanking on the word. <laughs> a, a degree. All right, so do they have uh, the right kind of degree? And we're looking for an MFA, Master of Fine Arts, or a PhD uh, in creative uh, writing. So that's one of the reasons why uh, some of those folks would get rejected. Uh, they don't have one of those items. Uh, so if you can say, look, the reason, maybe that person gets upset, they complain. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, why didn't you bring me in? Or why didn't, why, did I, why was I not considered? If you can say, look, uh, th these were the reasons we have, we required a, a MFA or PhD, but yada, yada. Uh, you didn't have it. Uh, that's why you got rejected. That, does, that doesn't seem like a personal thing at all. Uh, it's very clear. And, and maybe they could still get mad if they want, but, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, that would be on them at that point. Uh, now, giving alternatives, if there are any, always a good step as well. Uh, people appreciate that. Shows that you you can't help them, but 
in uh, the way, in that way, uh, but you're still trying to help them in another way, and I, I think everybody appreciates that. Uh, requests from internal audience, so somebody within the company, a coworker, colleague, basically, uh, use knowledge of the culture, individual, <laughs> to craft reply. <laughs> You know, this isn't a fancy way to say use common sense. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, clearly, if it's a coworker, you know the, the person well enough, hopefully, to make an intelligent response, or at least enough about how things are usually done there uh, at that company. And here we have the disciplinary, disciplinary notices and performance. Uh, appraisal. So for these, you might be a man, you might be a manager, a supervisor, uh, that sort of position, a teacher, uh, I guess, uh, I guess a police officer. <laughs> I might fit, do these from time to time. Probably everybody would do the performance appraisal uh, at some point. You know, how well is this person doing in their job? Uh, maybe they're not doing very well at all. Uh, so they say present directly, uh, no buffer. Uh, you don't want to torture somebody basically by making them sweat <laughs> and wait and the anticipation's building up like what uh, what's going to happen to me uh, you're just making it worse that way uh, site specific observations of behavior uh, again it's, it's sort of similar to that uh, idea about the uh, uh, the applications and bringing in people for in interviews right uh, so if somebody's not going to get a good evaluation from you uh, they want to know specific things, right? And they don't want you there just saying, well, it just so happens that we just don't like you. <laughs> or we think you're lazy. Uh, of course, the person's just going to say, look, that's ridiculous. You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, instead of that, you'd want to have some very specific things you've noticed, documented, uh, that you can point out. You know, not inferences and, and dates and, and quantities even. Uh, I'm imagining, I don't remember where I read this, but I read that uh, the main people who steal from uh, Walmart's <laughs> employees of Walmart. Uh, so, and that's not just true for Walmart, but all these uh, stores, usually the uh, the biggest people they have to protect themselves from are their own employees. And uh, they have to be careful though, they can't, if they just are suspicious of somebody, obviously they can't uh, fire them based on that. Uh, but if they have them on camera, specific dates, and they know this is a pattern, right? They know exactly how much stuff was stolen and uh, how much it was worth and all that. Uh, that's pretty rock solid, right? Uh, state when the employee may return to work if a disciplinary action is taken. Uh, so this is kind of in that vein of not wanting to have two or three emails to deal with when just one would have been sufficient. Uh, so this is maybe somebody's getting suspended for a while. Uh, but they can come back, you know, next week or a couple days, whatever. All right, and here's probably the most sensitive one of all. It's uh, having to lay off somebody or fire somebody. Very serious issues. And uh, nobody's going to be happy about this, obviously. But there's, some, again, some ways to make it not so bad. And to try to soften the blow and at least show that you are caring. Uh, now, one of the things you can do is, if you know that the company is likely to go to fold, let people know early so they have time to look for other work. And this just happened recently here in St. Cloud. They, uh, the Electrolux company that employs uh, something like seven, 800 people. Uh, they announced that they are shutting down the factory here in St. Cloud and they're going to open up a new one in, I think, North Carolina, <laughs> someplace like that. Uh, but they said it wouldn't happen until uh, late uh, the following year. I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it's over a year in advance. So, uh, yeah, it's terrible news, but at least people have a chance then to figure out what they're going to do. It would have been a lot worse if they had waited until, you know, like a month before, and it was just a sudden thing. Uh, now, firing, uh, again, this can, it opens up a lot. It's, <laughs> you know, talk to somebody that, that has to hire people, a small business owner, and they'll tell you, uh, it's not like in the movies where you just say, oh, you're fired and they're gone. You know, it's a lot more difficult. There's a lot of legal issues around uh, firing somebody or even laying people off. And uh, basically you can easily find yourself on the other end of a lawsuit uh, if you don't handle this well, maybe even if you do. Uh, but they say uh, here to give the honest reason uh, that the person was fired. 
And a couple items to go with this. Uh, if you try to save face, using unrelated face-saving reasons may create legal liability. That's so what we were talking before about how the uh, Walmart, uh, the, <laughs> uh, the number one thieves, it's not shoplifters coming in from outside, it's actually the employees. Uh, so let's just say they've caught a manager, let's say it's a, a manager, and they've caught uh, her, uh, her <laughs> uh, just basically stealing a lot of stuff from the store, right? And let's just say, though, it's a nice person. They It's a nice enough uh, employee. Uh, maybe they you don't really feel like they are did it out of e for evil purposes. Maybe there was toys for their kids or something. I don't know. And maybe you feel a little sorry for the person and you think, well, look, you know, let's not let's fire her or him. But let's not say it was for stealing. Let's just say it was because they were late too much <laughs> or they missed too much work or uh, or something like that. And the problem there, of course, is this person might decide they don't, hey, I wasn't late, or I, I'd never missed work. You know, so there, there again, they've got you in court, and they're uh, arguing with this. So even though you tried to help them out by coming up with a less lesser reason, um, it came back to bite you. What, what is that saying? Um, no kind deed goes unpunished. <laughs> I think that's the way to think of that first one. Well, let's see. Avoid broadcasting the reasons to avoid a defamation lawsuit. Uh, so most of the time, it's really nobody else's business, right? It's uh, Walmart. It's fi Walmart fires you for stealing. Uh, they're not going to go to the newspapers and, and tell all. <laughs> if somebody calls up the store, uh, they might... You know, I don't know what kind of legal obligations they would be under to say that's why you got fired. Uh, the, again, there's a lot of legal stuff around that kind of thing. Uh, but it would be very stupid for them to be out there announcing it everywhere or, or talking to reporters about it, I guess. <laughs> you know, if there was something that uh, the newspapers were interested in. Uh, because, again, if it got out, the person could say, look, I was defamed here. Uh, what they're saying about me isn't true. Uh, I didn't steal from the company, and then again, you're you're they're suing you again. Uh, whereas maybe they wouldn't even thought to do this if you hadn't have been out there bla blabbing about it. Uh, so again, uh, no good manager <laughs> would ever do that. Uh, that's again not really anybody else's business. And then deliver orally and back it up in writing. So again, it just seemed like common sense to me, but I guess it does need to be to be said. Uh, with something this sensitive, you wouldn't want to just send an email. Uh, you'd want to call the person up or maybe have them come in or go see them face to face. And that's just so you can get across the uh, effective body language. Make sure you have the right pitch of voice so they can hear the concern in, in your voice. Uh, it's hard to do that just in writing. Uh, so you'd seldom see that kind of information just in an email. That would seem cold uh, and impersonal and, again, just probably... Uh, make the situation worse or worse than it needed to be. And then lastly, we have some thoughts here about, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, technology. And really the, uh, the basic advice here is just to deliver the bad news orally uh, when possible. So that could be face to face or it could be a phone call. Uh, so if you're going to fire somebody or somebody's going to uh, fail the class or just something that's serious enough, uh, where you think there will be a, you know, you're going to hurt this person's feelings. If you can do it, if you can uh, deliver that news over the phone or in person where you can use body language, you can use the appropriate emotional tone, right? You can, uh, you, you have a lot more uh, emotional uh, tools to work with, I guess I could put it that way, uh, than you would with an email or a text or something where it's not always obvious that you're sincere, right, or come across as being cold. Uh, so, yeah, good advice, but obviously you can't always do that. Uh, think of a class like this. You know, if I, I'm not going to call every student with the same piece of information. That would just uh, take too long. Uh, so I would have to use an email. Uh, social media is kind of interesting. I was thinking about this one. Uh, a lot of companies are using Twitter, and sometimes they'll even use Twitter to deal with or to send out 
uh, these negative messages. And I think they do that uh, again to, well, they know people are checking the social media, <laughs> so they'll see it. Uh, of course, there is the risk that, uh, you know, if, if all a company ever, is ever tweeting out is negative stuff, it might give you a bad impression. Uh, on the other hand, it might show that, you know, they've got nothing to hide and they're, they're being honest. I don't know. I, I think you could play around with that last one a bit. It's, it's interesting to me. Uh, but anyway, that will do it for this uh, presentation. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do have questions, comments, uh, hopefully good good news <laughs> to communicate, uh, please, uh, let me, uh, please feel, feel free to do that. Uh, but have a good day and see you next time.